Chapter 1. Tension No one could help the boy. The demon was destroying him with seizures and fits that flung him into fire and water. His father was desperate. He loved his son and would move heaven and earth to save him. If he could not find a way to help his boy, he would lose him. The man heard of a teacher, a teacher who walked on water, calmed storms with a word, and even raised the dead. But the teacher did something more. He looked demons in the eye and banished them with a word. The man knew because the teacher had done it to a whole swarm of demons by sending them into a herd of pigs that immediately turned tail and rushed into the sea to drown. If anyone could help his son, this teacher could. The father took his scarred and frailed son and found Jesus, or rather his followers. He asked them for help, but they could do nothing. In his fear and hurt, the man became angry and spoke harshly to the followers. Defensive and ashamed of their powerlessness, they lashed back. Just then, Jesus arrived. Mark's epistle tells the story of what happened next. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. More than any other story in Scripture, this one exhibits the Christian experience of belief. It doesn't explain it or clarify it. It doesn't describe it or give direction. Instead, it captures the experience perfectly. At first blush, this story has little to do with our daily lives. We live in a decidedly natural state with tangible lives. Most of us live modern, technologically driven lives in the Western world, and this story seems almost fanciful and a bit frightening. It's the kind of thing that happened long ago in a galaxy far, far away. After all, it's the story of an exorcism, but without the Hollywood flair and excitement of Linda Blair spewing out pea soup and oatmeal. In this real-life exorcism, the Son of God exercised His power and exorcised a demon. Victory was had, and a boy was saved. But as with so much of Scripture, there's something more here. In fact, a single sentence from this story holds the keys to the mystery of belief. On my right forearm, I have a tattoo. I'd long heard the advice, don't get a tattoo unless it's something you want on you forever. I took this advice to heart as a teen and through most of my 20s. It saved me from a handful of potentially embarrassing decisions. Remember when barbed wire tats were popular? I don't have one. I got my tattoo a couple weeks before my 30th birthday. I was old enough to know better and to know exactly what I was doing. I'd lived enough life to find something I wanted permanently inked on my body. It isn't art. It isn't flashy. Just simple script serving as a reminder my soul needs to see every day. I believe. Help my unbelief. In my mid-twenties, I went through what would rightly be called a crisis of faith, a true test of whether I should devote my life to what I grew up believing about Jesus. I was faced with the decision of walking away from it all, because that would be the easier thing to do, or turning to Jesus and giving Him all of my life. I'll share more about this later. For most of my life, I had felt the pull, the tension of faith. I had felt the draw of sin and given in often. I believed in Jesus, but I doubted. I believed in Jesus, but I didn't. Then, 
One day I stumbled across this story from Mark. I'd read it dozens of times, but this time it grabbed me. That one sentence grabbed me. The father's words gripped my heart with a vice-like power. In five words, he explained so much of the Christian's experience, of my experience. That simple sentence is the key to the struggles, the ups and downs, the winding road of belief. In a breath, he expressed the highest of heights, the strength of virtue, the emptiness of doubt, and the yearning for something onto which he could hold. He spoke of being pulled in two opposite directions, one of peace and the other of chaos and fear. And he spoke of clinging, holding fast, knowing to whom he should look. All this in five little words. Seesaws and Tug of War Christians who don't know the tension of, I believe, help my unbelief, might not be Christians at all, or at least they might be very infantile ones. Our faith is one of brutal tensions. Not everyone can express this, but every Christian knows it. We feel it in our guts. We feel the motion of the up and down and down and up. We feel as if we're going to bust in half as we're pulled in two directions at once. To not recognize the significance of these words indicates a simplistic, thoughtless belief. It isn't a mark of maturity, but rather of not being mature enough to know our own weakness and need. Tension is our state of being for all of this life, and to live as a believer is to live in it. We are born sinners incapable of making ourselves pleasing to God, yet called to be holy as God is holy. We are finite creatures seeking to understand an infinite God. We trust that God is good, although the world he created and sovereignly rules is filled with badness. We think in terms of scientific evidence, proof, and logic, though our holy book tells us of miracles and supernatural occurrences. We believe God is omnipresent, though we can see him nowhere. We have one God in three persons, but not three gods. We defy the economy of earthly power by following a leader who died to save us, who willingly laid down his glory and power, and who calls us to be the least in order to be great. We live in this world, but are told it is not our home. We are not of this place. Our king came and ushered in his kingdom, but then left with a promise of his return. So we wait. We are saved by faith, not by good or moral works. But faith without good or moral works is dead. We are called to consider suffering as joy. We follow the teachings of a book that is in part clear and in part mysterious and enigmatic. Each of these tensions holds true for every Christian. They ebb, flow, spike, and ease off, but they're always present. At points, they have overwhelmed me, and other times, they've hardened me because they seem too much to accept. And all the time, I feel the roiling of the seesaws rise and fall. My heart plays tug of war with me, sometimes over doubts, and other times over sin. I trust, but not as I should, not always. I obey, but not as I ought, not always. I don't take many things at face value. I question nearly everything. The upside of this is that I'm curious and love to learn. The downside is is that I'm a cynic who trusts my own impressions and opinions instead of trusting others. This meant that as a child and into my teens, I found it easy to disregard teachers or even my parents. I wasn't usually rebellious, just dismissive, though often with a snide retort thrown in to show my wit and wisdom. As I grew older, this questioning turned into a subtle sort of pride. I saw myself as the arbiter of truth in my own life. I knew the Bible was true. I knew all the answers about theology, faith, and the Christian life. But underneath it all was that pride giving me the permission to ignore what I knew and give in to greed and lust and dishonesty. And as sin does, it fed my doubts about others and fed my confidence in myself. At no point, though, did God ever let me forget Him or leave him completely. 
At one level, I did believe. I did know. I did follow. I wasn't throwing myself into sin. I was simply accepting sin in my otherwise Christian life. I wanted to be a follower of Jesus, and I wanted to be a follower of Barnabas. I believed and I doubted, back and forth, back and forth. And in the end, here I stand. I believe, help my unbelief.